to the instruction course on preparing postgraduates in surgical training. We're looking at some innovations that we have in postgraduate surgical training. So we've put up a stellar panel over here to give us some intricacies on postgraduate surgical training. Ophthalmology residency hugely comprises of surgical training and it can start all the way from home up to complex surgeries in the theater. We are looking at certain innovations and interesting ideas and suggestions that our stellar panel is going to put across. Our first uh, panelist and speaker is Dr. Gayatri, a cornea surgeon who has a keen interest in postgraduate training. Her, her surgeries are impeccable and she's known for her precision and her patience in the OT. Over to you, Dr. Gayatri. Good morning, everyone. I'm very happy to be part of this IC. So today I'll be talking on transition from wet lab to simulators to complex surgeries. So why is wet lab training so important? So we all know ophthalmic surgeries require high precision, meticulousness, and fine motor skills. We need extremely good hand-eye coordination and adaptation to microscope. And a fundamental component of residency is undergoing a structured surgical training. So apart from that, it is also essential to ensure patient safety and good quality results without compromising the resident's training. So the process of perfecting a skill is uh, such as swimming uh, starts with uh, initial basic skill transfer and then analytical skill development and then jumping into real life situations. So similarly for surgery as well, we need initial good hand holding by a mentor, practice and skill development and then facing real life situations. So apart from this, wet lab also helps in getting comfortable with your microscope so we don't waste much time in adjusting the microscope, uh, getting to know your IPD and getting comfortable with that, working on the correct posture and ergonomics, getting to be ambidextrous, adjusting your foot switch position so you don't waste time in the OT and also your fine focus adjustments. So when we uh, look at surgical training, the various options we have is wet lab, either with a cadaveric eye, human eye, or animal eye model or synthetic eye. Uh, we also have skills lab uh, with simulation model or virtual reality. And of course, advanced mentoring with uh, tele-mentoring or AI. So uh, how to set up a wet lab? This is a very nice paper uh, published in IJO during a COVID time where uh, they spoke about the basic requirements for setting up a wet lab. So your wet lab should ideally be in within the main hospital with easy access for residents. It should be a 10 by 10 feet space, which is which can accommodate two people, the, the resident and the trainee, the trainer, uh, along with the microscope, the FACO machine and other basic requirements. So when we talk about the tissue for practice, we can either start with human eyes, which are unfit for transplantation, uh, that will be ideal for size and the tissue consistency. But of course, the drawback is the availability of tissue. The other option is goat's eye, which is easily available from the butcher or, and it's also cost effective. But uh, the drawback will be it's a larger eyeball with an increased lens thickness. Uh, so how do we fix the eye or mount the tissue? So we can either fashion something like this, uh, a simple uh, medical sample container where uh, a, a perture is made in the center, just uh, small enough to hold the eye and you can stuff the, uh, the box with uh, cotton so the tissue is retained well. Uh, alternatively, we can invest in something like this. This is an eye stand uh, which is designed by Madhu Surgicals which will be uh, very useful to mount the tissue. So another very interesting device which was uh, designed by uh, Aravindai Hospital is called the SAFE apparatus, the spring action apparatus for fixation of eyeball. So they have taken a hollow cylinder with uh, one uh, hole and uh, they have uh, fitted a spring action uh, syringe inside. So once your tissue is mounted, you just have to uh, uh, pull out the vacuum and uh, because of the suction action, the tissue is retained very well. So it's very easy to uh, it gives good stability for the tissue during practice. We also have synthetic eye models such as this. So this is a FACO eye again uh, designed by uh, Madhu Surgicals. And uh, this is also very cost effective. It costs about 1400 for 10 uh, eyes. So we can practice all steps of FACO emulsification. Uh, we also have the Kitaro sets which are uh, manufactured in Japan. So in this we can uh, again do all the steps of the surgery. This is an example of the Rexis uh, in the Kitaro eye model. So uh, this is something like gelatin paper which uh, we can fashion our cystitome and practice the Rexis at ease. 
So another very interesting way of uh, wet lab training is the surgical simulator. So I'll be showing you a video of the help me see simulator. So in this, uh, this is a virtual reality uh, device where uh, with your, uh, it has uh, motion sensors and with your tactile feedback, you'll be able to do all the steps of the surgery. This is a step of the uh, nucleus cracking, uh, FACO2 and irrigation aspiration and you can also implant the IOL. So it's a very good device to uh, again refine our uh, cognitive skills and the psychomotor skills which are involved for a good um, surgery. So all this is great if we have access to it, but what if we don't have access? So this is something uh, that uh, we do at uh, Ramchandra Medical College, which is, which is your smartphone wet lab. So you just need to have the basic uh, surgical instruments. Uh, you can uh, place your smartphone with the flash uh, switched on at a comfortable working distance, uh, increase the magnification. So your uh, your camera is the eyepiece and your screen is your uh, is, is what you have to look at. And uh, with your uh, magnification increased, you can have very good uh, visibility of the uh, surgical field. The only drawback is that uh, you will not have good uh, stereopsis with this when you compare it to a microscope. So this is a video of our resident practicing suturing on the uh, thermocall. We can also practice the uh, SICS tunnel. So we need to take a, a, a table tennis ball and place it on a container and uh, stick the thermocall which comes with our suture material. And once this is done, you can just fashion your tunnel uh, very comfortably. And the reason for using this ball is because it gives you the contour of the sclera. So it, it's, it's very similar to uh, tunneling in a patient as well. Uh, we can also practice rexis in uh, a tomato. Uh, this is a microwave tomato and uh, you can mark out the rexis so it's easy to do. And uh, this, a stapler pin will also act as a guide as a paracentesis so you have to go through that incision. So all, all of this is done with a smartphone. This is a, a video of a resident practicing iris hooks insertion. So for this there was no fancy equipment required. We just used our smartphone with our uh, uh, flashlight on. Uh, so apart from all this that I have shown, a very, very important, uh, vital part of learning to, in today's world is from online resources. We have so many of these uh, wonderful pages with all, our, all of our mentors who are uploading content consistently and they are, uh, you know, showing the steps of uh, all surgeries and especially most of these uh, channels focus on FACO for beginners. So it's very important and it's it makes it very easy for us to uh, watch these shows and refine our skills. So I'd like to end with a very famous quote by Benjamin Franklin. Tell me and I forget. Teach me and I may remember. Involve me and I learn. Thank you. Thank you, Gayatri, for that innovative talk. And a lot of uh, surgical training starts at the wet lab. Uh, the importance of all the equipment that we have in the wet lab. Our next speaker is Dr. Arvind Babu. He's trained most of us sitting here, and he's a very senior cataract surgeon uh, who has been involved in postgraduate training for over 20 years. He will be talking about how to tackle the human eye in the OT, transitioning from the wet lab into the operating theater. Over to you, sir. Good morning everybody. Uh, at the outset I would like to thank Dr. Narayan for giving me this opportunity. So my topic for today is intricacies and innovations in resident surgical training. So these are few intricacies, the problems which uh, residents face when they enter the OR. Uh, things like hand-eye coordination, site of incision, where to put the incision, uh, poor incision construction, size and completion of capsulotomy, nucleus management and uh, suturing. So the other pitfalls in is uh, like hierarchical system of case allocation. Uh, usually the PGs are made to operate law at the end and with suboptimal surgical instruments, microscopes, suboptimal trained uh, assistants and support staff. So we should try to give them a better atmosphere so that uh, they could learn. So these are a few innovations uh, for residents. 
to learn better and faster like goat size model size simulators wet lab uh, incision and suture site markings and refine guided uh, capsulotomy so this is a goat size model so where the, the lens is aspirated and it is integrated with a human cataractus lens so and then a fake uh, it is emulsified so innovations like these help them to learn better and faster so wet labs help them to get familiar with microscopes and instruments they develop good uh, uh, hand eye coordination uh, suturing on gloves animalize and post mortem humanize simulators uh they they help in suturing and other uh, steps it minimizes the learning curve and it also provides the residents a smooth transition from one surgery to another the other things they need uh, are good instruments good equipment uh, in particular good ovd uh, the trainer should be trained uh, there is there should be a standardized and monitored surgical training program for the residents from from the first year to the final year they should maintain the log books they enter the complications etc for them to uh, review them and then uh, residents should be trained to use the non dominant hand we also provide them a lot of surgical lectures and discussions uh, uh, there is exposure to fa exposure to fake emulsification we have side scopes and monitors so that they can learn from their mistakes uh, their their surgeries and steps are recorded and reviewed uh, examination of post op cases is encouraged uh, so that they could learn better Uh, they should understand that safety is more important than speed. Uh, finally, they should be proactive and there should be a desire to learn. So generally, in the first year, uh, we uh, encourage them to go for wet lab uh, observation in the ORs and uh, start the uh, conventional cataract extraction. In the second year, they are, they, can, they do generally do independent uh, conventional cataract extraction and some steps of small incision cataract surgery. In the third year, they do independent small incision cataract surgery, assisted facos, and they also assist juniors. So this is a small video done by my resident. So after the basic steps of like superior rectus bridle and uh, peritomy. So we generally mark the surgical limbus with. marker three points are made and uh, the is asked to follow the points he or she are exactly on this surgical limbus so that uh, the complications and bleeding and going extending into the sclera are all so it makes the surgery a lot easier for them and we encourage them to use 15 blade and then with 11 blade so the ac entry is made and uh, this is a measured capsulotomy it refine is used to uh, mark the capsular excess size usually around the 5.5 to 6 mm so it acts as a guide for them to do a good capsulotomy or a capsular excess so the resident generally follows the marking so that the, the size of the excess can be measured I also encourage them to learn all steps of nucleus management into the delivery pressure and counter pressure the conventional type level so here uh, then this co expresses it so intraocular lens inserted into the capsular bag and it is dialed to the, so that the 3 and 9 o'clock
the optimum position of the intraocular lens. Site also for them uh, so that they get equidus radial sutures and to avoid the like, uh, high astigmatism and etc. So all these things help them to uh, uh, go into the next level. Uh, they uh, they master the tunneling in the wet lab and suturing and also the nucleus management they are trained so that the the, the next they can go into the next level of uh, small incision cataract surgery and then finally uh, they can uh, move on to phaco emulsification so this is a surgery done by my resident this is a small incision cataract surgery so tunneling and then the uh, nucleus management is done So studies and surveys showed significant variation in the extent of surgical training to residents. And we all know that cataract surgery is the most commonly performed elective surgery globally and in India. So I'd like to conclude by saying that surgical proficiency in all types of cataract surgery is extremely crucial for a successful and a well-rounded residency program. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for that insightful talk. Uh, I'm sure these innovations will really help many people train postgraduates better and the transition into surgeries will be a lot easier. Our next speaker is a very close friend of mine and a fantastic cataract surgeon, Dr. Anjum, who is known for his uh, meticulous uh, techniques and he's also known for managing complications very innovatively. Uh, over to you, Dr. Anjum, to take us through how to manage complications in cataract surgeries. Since there's a slight technical difficulty, we'll just uh, proceed with the next topic, which is a 3D approach to complex surgeries. So um, my colleague, Dr. John and I, um, when we were looking at postgraduate training a few years ago, um, and then of course decided to do a lot of complicated surgeries, realized that in our experience of doing these surgeries, that the implantation of complicated devices may not be that simple. Uh, it looks a lot easier when they are on screen, when they are on YouTube, but actually putting it into application may not be easy when it comes into the human eye. So it does require a little bit of practice, but there is an issue with that too. You may not be able to get these devices as a lot of them are quite expensive and then to use them multiple times in the wet lab may not be very easy. So we, we came up with an idea to actually manufacture those devices. The manufacturing is a very difficult word to use because there's a lot of approval and patenting and so on and so forth. So we found out shapes and devices which can be as close to the original as possible. And that is why we decided to 3D print many of those devices 
and then implant them into the wet lab and then finally use them into surgical training. So when we look, looked at wet lab and uh, some of it was uh, spoken about in the earlier uh, um, presentations, uh, we looked at 3D printing the actual wet lab. So this is Tempo, which is a three-dimensional 3D printed uh, simulated eye, which, did, which is very similar to what uh, Dr. Gayatri talked about in the safe technology developed by Arvind. They did a lot of that in a three-dimensional way by 3D printing it into the actual device and then using it for wet lab training. So we decided to further our thought. We decided if they could do 3D printing of all these structures, I'm sure 3D printing of devices also may not be too hard. So we looked at what we could implant. At that time, we were embarking from trabeculectomy into glaucoma drainage devices. And then we had this one patient with Marfan syndrome with a subluxated lens. We decided to put a capsular tension segment and a ring and realized that it was way harder than it could ever possibly be. If we had had a little bit of exposure and a little bit of training in how to do these things, maybe we could have gotten a little better. So that decided uh, on our next journey where we decided to actually 3D print and uh, put these devices for practice. So we use a free catch software, which is an open source software and use resin based 3D printing. So the models were authored on FreeCAD. It's an open source software. They are 3D printed using a, a SLA printer and the material used for this is UV sensitive photopolymer resin. All the designs were uploaded on Thingiverse. If you look at all three, we're, uh, all th three points that I made, they are all free sources, open sources. So there is actually zero to no cost involved in printing this. The effective cost of what each of these devices would be, be less than 100 rupees. So they can be printed multiple times and in one single print, we might even be able to get four to five pieces of the same device. So then we, the, um, so this is the uh, resin based model and the 3D printing lab available at our dental facility which is used to already printing many uh, photopolymers for uh, prosthodontics. So we, look, we uh, put, it, put them into the 3D printing machine and it takes about 12 to 14 hours to print many of these and then they are dried and cut into the various shapes that are required to actually put them in. So if you look at the various devices that we had printed, they are usually geometrical or symmetrical in shape because the closest that we could get were symmetrical structures on the free softwares. The paid softwares, however, can allow you more complex designs. So that could be a limitation of using a free software. And then that is uploaded to the uh, to Thingiverse, which is again an open source material. And if you look at our devices, they are, they are very simple to print. They are usually either a, a polyhedral like the BHEX. And this is we got the Sioni and the capsular tension ring and the Ahmed segment to be printed and the intricacies in design were redrawn and then finally printed out. So when we decided to do the uh, Ahmed, uh, glaucoma device, we decided it was a valve structure. In creating a valve could be a lot harder. So we decided to go to the next non-valve structure that we had, which is the Adi. The Adi has a foot plate and a uh, polymer like based uh, tubing in the front. So to design and uh, these 3D printing devices, we looked at the possibilities. The 3D printing these devices could be very expensive and can be very difficult and the learning curve is also a lot longer. So to uh, get the actual shape, we decided to use the original dimensions of the implant to get a stimulated variant as close as the original that is possible. So we used the, uh, the uh, open source free cat software to draw many of our devices and then use resin as a polymer to 3D print the device. Once the resin uh, model was made, it was taken to the wet lab, uh, to the um, 3D lab, and then we printed the actual uh, foot plate with that. Now we needed a tube to be part of the, uh, to the uh, footprint of the plate. So we decided to use the pediatric venflon, which is very similar in boring to the original device, attached it to the foot plate, and then got the actual foot plate with the uh, tubing in front. The tubing patency is always checked and made sure that there is no leak or there is no block in any part of the tube. That is very important for the device to actually filter. So that's the first step of doing it, which is called priming. Next, the device is implanted into the conjunctival peritomized section. 
we put it as cl uh, close to the original as possible, which is about 10 millimeters to the base after marking it. Once the foot plate is tucked inside, it has to be secured and anchored with a 10-0 nylon. Since our foot plate is a little larger, we used about 9-0 proline. We don't use any kind of vitral sutures because they might uh, tug off and it cannot be a little difficult to implant. Once that is done, we have to trim the tube and make it a beveled tube so that we can implant it into the anterior chamber. Prior to that, a needle tract is made 4 millimeters away from the limbus and once the tract is uh, made to reach all the way to the limbus, the anterior chamber is entered and the actual tube is tugged into the tract to make sure it enters the anterior chamber. So the bevel position becomes very important and that is why using the pediatric Venflon was very similar to actually using the glaucoma drainage device where we can put the tube into the anterior chamber. Once that is done, you can see that the tip of the tube is seen beautifully in the anterior chamber. This is the evolution of all the uh, devices that we used over a period of time and finally arrived at what is closest to what we could actually make. The effective uh, cost of making this entire thing was less than about 100 rupees. And once it was done, we were able to implant the device into the goat side and practice it multiple times before we entered the OT. And trust me, it was easier than actually doing the original surgery because our surgical time was reduced and the, uh, the, the common mistakes and the difficulties people face with using the glaucoma drainage device also became a lot lesser. We also printed the Sioni and the uh, BHEX ring and used it for may, very may, many surgeries. So um, my co-speaker will be talking about the complex surgeries that are uh, present today and how to tackle them. But implanting those devices directly may be very difficult for a beginner. And this is a good way to begin. Just print it and look at the world in a three-dimensional view. Thank you. So uh, till our uh, next uh, speaker gets set, uh, set up, um, I have a question for you, sir, for training postgraduates. What are the com common steps you think postgraduates find it difficult in the OT? What do you think is the, the hardest part for them to actually uh, find difficult when they're starting surgeries? So as I already mentioned, uh, they usually find suturing the most difficult because when they start they have problems in uh, orientation and depth perception and hand-eye coordination so the first they should master the suturing and then the site of incision and uh, nucleus management i think these three steps are very crucial for them to uh, learn and then they can advance uh, further tissue handling is also a very important part to uh, definitely Right. We have our uh, next speaker, Dr. Anjum, who is going to prepare the postgraduate to tackle complications. Over to you. Is it working? Yeah, correct. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm sorry I had some technical difficulties, some complications in my own presentation here. Uh, thank you, Dr. Narayanan, for giving me this opportunity um, for um, in giving this instruction course on preparing the postgraduate to tackle complications in a slightly uh, variated way. So let's start with one of the few complications which uh, generally we see in our uh, daily postgraduate training, which could be a screen buttonholing of a screen tunnel, an intumescent cataract which can turn out to be an Argentinian flag, a PC rent, and aerodialysis or even high FEMA because of virus manipulation. So first, what do we know and what have we learned? 
So whenever a PG makes a mistake, do not reprimand them, just encourage them, sit with them, go through the steps. If they have a video, just show them the video, show them where they have gone wrong and help them understand how to proceed further and always make sure you have a backup plan when you have a complicated case. So when you have a backup plan, you stay, try to stay calm and then uh, staying calm helps you avoid making any uh, uh, cloud your judgments and proceed in a easy way and if everything doesn't go well or uh, go south just pray harder and hope you have some friends in the vr department so when you have any uh, so usually pgs can start off with a well dilated pupil but due to some iris manipulation the pupil can undergo an intra meiosis so initially we can start off with a uh, a simple sphincterotomy which could be a radial sphincterotomy or micro sphincterotomies which can give you a well dilated pupil to deliver the lens. Next you can start implanting iris hooks. Iris hooks can be initially um, difficult but then as you start training them they can understand how it works. So this is something which we started training our PGs. This is a Gupta ring, no financial interest. So Gupta ring can have four scrolls. You just have to flex the scroll into the cartridge. It could be an IOL cartridge. And after which it is, it can be injected into the anterior chamber, just like an IOL, but just make sure that the plane of insertion is under the iris and does not go into the uh, sulcus and use visco to form the anterior chamber and the other scrolls make sure the first scroll goes underneath and the rest of the scrolls can be guided through using a second instrument which could be a dialer or a, a y hook or a faco tip of i mean sorry a faco rod so as you can see you can get a well dilated pupil after which you can proceed with either a faco or an sics So here we have a resident who inadvertently ruptured the capsule. You can see that after applying the dye, um, there's an Argentinian flag. So what we did was we continued with an SICS. We just um, entered the anterior chamber, formed the visco I mean, formed the AC with some amount of uh, sodium hyaluronate, and delivered the anterior. I mean, delivered the nucleus using the anterior chamber I mean anterior capsule rim as a scaffold and after which you can just insert or implant the IOL after implanting the IOL you can trim the anterior capsular rim This will give the patient a good visual uh, quality of life, avoid any form of anterior capsular uh, phimosis or contracture syndrome. So always have a backup plan, like I said, when a, um, a postgraduate starts off training for FACO, he might go through any complications such as a run out rexes or any form where you might have to change over to convert to an SICS or an ECC. So this is a simple innovative way where you just continue the FACO wound, make radial cuts, back end cuts and include the FACO wound into your tunnel. So this way you avoid any new incisions, have a good anterior chamber, there is no iris prolapse and you after postoperatively you tend to have a smaller uh, astigmatism you can see that we are proceeding with a regular uh, scleral groove here and including the original phaco incision tunnel make sure you make nice scleral pockets so that the delivery is easy
and the rest is the usual. So oftentimes you can see uh, that there is a zonal weakness due to sudo exfoliation or any other uh, manipulation during intraop. So this is where we insert in CTR. So in a beginner's hand for a postgraduate, there could be difficulties in inserting a CTR. So this is a easy way where you just thread the CTR into a CTR implanter and after which once it's inserted and threaded in you're ready to implant it and implantation is as easy as implanting Yeah, so you just implant it into the, um, under the anterior capsular rim and make sure the, the, uh, the insertion is away from the zonular weakness. And when you're inserting, use a second instrument so that you can guide the CTR into the, uh, into the right plane. So when you have a PCR, just hang in there like our hanging IOL technique where we anchor a rigid IOL, in this case a three-piece rigid IOL. Uh, you just take the suture into the, uh, the IOL uh, dialing hole, after which you can implant the lens with full confidence and if there's any uh, instability in your capsular bag, you can always uh, explant it out, use the free end of the suture to remove it. So if everything doesn't work out, what is next? You can claw your way out using an iris claw. So here again, we are anchoring the iris claw with a suture. So this gives the PG a little bit of confidence when inserting it. And it's also easy to enclave this iris claw and on the right side you can see that these are the iris um, the orientation or the uh, you can see that, that there is a cat eye initially a postgraduate can have a cat eye pupil later on after a certain practice he can get a well rounded pupil Okay, so finally we have this unusual complication, but we often tend to see this complication in our practice. So here we have an, an improper loading of an IOL where you can see that there's a broken haptic once it's implanted inside the bag. So rather than removing the IOL just like that or explanting or IOL cutting it, you can use another IOL to use the other IOL as a scaffold, implant the second IOL into the bag and after which, I'm sorry. And when you're inserting the other IOL as a scaffold, you can cut the first primary IOL which you had implanted using an IOL cutting scissors. Oftentimes when you cut the IOL, um, the IOL slips forward. So use a secondary instrument such as a FACO uh, ball tip dialer or uh, any Y hook so that you can grip the IOL and cut it and after which you can remove it through a 4 millimeter or a 4.5 millimeter incision. So I hope these tips have given you some insights or ideas on how to train your PGs and uh, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you Dr. Anjum, uh, that really was very insightful and our last speaker for the day is Dr. Anju Kuriakos. She is the kitchen ophthalmic surgeon. So surgical training doesn't have to only start in the wet lab, it could start much earlier even in the uh, in your houses, in your kitchen. And this is an innovative uh, surgical training video where they've used everyday equipment to train PGs in surgical training.
Good morning to one and all present here. Uh, precisely three years back, we had a scenario where we couldn't do anything which was discussed by the previous speakers. We were not allowed to do any wet labs. We were not able to get access to any go tie or anything of that sort. At that time, we were in the lockdown. We were at home. So how did we use the lockdown? As a postgraduate, we get only three years during the training. So within that three years, we'll have to uh, finish. We are expected to uh, do a good SICS. Minimum. So how did we convert our kitchen, whatever is available at home, into a wet lab? So this is a video about it. Audio. Audio is there. the max have to work extra hard to get ahead in this world. In addition to all that, the year 2020 brought a lot of surprises. The coronavirus attacked humanity. It rapidly spread across all the countries of the world. The world had to go into a lockdown. Elective surgeries reduced drastically and surgical training practically stopped. Practicing in the wet lab became even more important. Many surgical trainees were stuck at home and resorted to hobbies like cooking. To make the best use of this time, we cooked up an idea. Why not convert the kitchen into a wet lab? Let's take the ingredients. Flour, oil, salt, water, tomato, boiled egg, grapes. Huh, do we need the fork and spoon? No, 
we need surgical instruments. Welcome to Anju's Kitchen. Mix flour in the bowl with salt, oil and water. Then knead the dough till it becomes the correct consistency. Sometimes the baby might want to help. Now let us multitask. Fire up the stove, put the water on and boil an egg. Now again take the dough and knead it into the shape of a face, make eye sockets and uh, nose and mouth. Remove the shell of the boiled egg and then cut it into two pieces and use that as the sclera of the eyeball. Put it under the face made of uh, dough, then cut grapes to put as uh, corneas. Um, watch out for the baby taking the hood while you are making this. You can practice local anesthesia with syringe and needle. You can simulate the feel of a microscope by putting a smartphone between two boxes with the video mode and flash on. This gives magnification, illumination and allows you to record your surgeries. A tomato with needle and thread can be used to practice Superior Rector's Bridal Sutures. SICS tunnel can be practiced on the boiled egg using a crescent blade, even a side fold, and also a keratomentary. If you have a magnifying loop, you can use that instead of the smartphone microscope. Make a cystitome by bending a 26 gauge needle. You can practice capsulorexis on the skin of a tomato which has been kept in the microwave for 5 to 10 seconds. You can also use that smartphone microscope simulator and an onion. Similarly, you can also do a can opener capsulotomy. Nucleus delivery can be practiced with metal wire to take out a seed or garlic for example. If Simco is not available, a syringe can be connected to a tube and pick up tissue paper bits from a bowl. It would definitely be better to practice irrigation aspiration with a Simco cannula. Bits of tissue paper can be aspirated from any bowl. For fecal emulsification, a piece of potato can be cut out. This can be cut in the shape of a cataract nucleus and using a pencil and needle can be chopped. If available, loading of foldable IOLs can be practiced. Along with the proper injection of the IOLs. Other than cataract, Trabeculectomy flap can also be practiced on the boiled egg. The incisions can be made and the flap can be raised. A cut grapes fixed on a toy can be used to practice suturing. can also be used for suturing practice. You can use building blocks as a corneal graphite and then use corneal scissors to cut out a circular bit of the tomato skin. This can then be transplanted onto some other fruit to practice corneal transplantation sutures. Cut out a circle of tomato skin and make a hole in the center to use as an iris. Thread a suture material through the sharp end of a needle so that it comes out of the hub. Let us do sewing machine technique of hydrodialysis return. Pass a needle with thread through the tomato and tissue paper, hold the thread, come out and 
pass it again through the tomato and tissue paper and this time hold that loop of suture material while coming out. Once again, go to the next point where you want to have the suture, pass the needle through the tomato and the tissue paper and once again hold the loop of the suture while coming out so that you get the next loop. Once you have had adequate loops, you can take the thread and pass it through all the previous loops and then tie it. Now let us practice single pass for tropioculoplasty. The straight needle is passed through two sides of the torn iris and then a Sinsky hook is used to pull out a loop of suture from the distal side. Then the needle is passed four times through this loop of suture material. Those are the four passes. And then both ends of the suture are pulled apart and the knot slides inside as a sliding sepsa knot. The two ends of the suture can be cut with a micro scissors inside the eye. Thank you all for watching. Hope this guides you to set up a wet lab in your kitchen and practice eye surgeries at home during this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. John. So we saved the best for the last and I think we can all go back home and go straight to the kitchen and start surgeries. Right. Thank you uh, for attending this instruction course. Hope it helps all of you help train postgraduates better. Thank you all.